Francis, welcome. Thank you, Paulina. So excited to talk to you. Um, so Likewise. I want to start with uh, when you were little, you were so obsessed with moving to the United States from Cameroon that your nickname as a little kid was American Boy. Do you remember where that obsession stemmed from? So as a little kid, I didn't know much about the United States, obviously. Um, but there was a World Cup 1994, and he was in the United States, in the United States. And uh, that's where we have a, um, then they started to put a color inside of the uh, beer cup, the, a country flags inside of the beer cup. And my best uh, was the United States flag, you know, and um, down the road, a lot of things like uh, movies, like I've been loving movies my entire life. And what I ask when I ask people about like this actor, this movie, and I'm like uh, from uh, United States, you know, so once again, at that age, I didn't know much about the geography and all the history and where is where. Didn't know even the difference about the planets, the country. But I know that some place that produced this thing that I love is the United States. And uh, a lot of things uh, came together. You know, I appear to be like biggest, I appear to like, I love all those uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme movies, all those action movies, like Sylvester Stallone, uh, Jean-Claude Van Damme. Um, then, so, I don't know, just loving them. And uh, one thing that I knew was that a city in the uh, United States was uh, San Francisco. And then people was calling me, like, since my name is Francis, they was calling me Francisco, and somebody would say San Francisco. Then I love that name so much because he's connected, he's really relate, uh, related me to the country that I love. And that's why, like, even today, if you look at my signature, if my autograph, my autograph is SF, and people never understand. I'm like, your name is not, there's not S on your name. I'm like, believe me, there's an S in my name, just not the one that you know. So wow. and, uh, I started like nickname myself. I mean, I used to have nickname all the time, but uh, my preferred one that the one that I give to myself was American boy. Uh, <laughs> and my dream has always been to like be in America. So, mm -hmm. I mean, my entire life, uh, a lot of things connected me to America. Like, I love the culture, I love the story, the movie. Everything in America uh, seems to uh, be like whatever what I love. So then I realized, like, early on in my life, that that's the place that I wanted to be. Basically, when I decided, like, uh, when I find out that what I want to do in my life is boxing, then. Mm -hmm. I also find out once again that the place to be is the United States because I know Mike Tyson and Holyfield. The story of Mike Tyson and Holyfield was worldwide and uh, every single kid uh, that have ever heard of boxing knew that story over here. So once again, it was an American story. So, mm. I mean, everything seems to like bring me in America and... Uh, that's I've, been, I've been grateful to make it there. I did whatever I could have done to get there. And I've been there for five years living my dream. Your first job when you were nine um, was an interesting one. Can you tell me what that job entailed and how much it paid? It was um, in the sand quarry. We were helping in the sand quarry, uh, which is a job uh, that means for adults but uh, we weren't strong enough, not experienced. And, uh, you know, at first we weren't like really paid, you know, we were hoping, helping people and they were just sending us there to work with people. And then whatever they give to our mom after that will be our pay. Like uh, until I think like one or two years after that they established our salary because it was my older brother and I, they established our salary for, uh, I think it was about one, one 
uh, one dollar and one and fifty cent. Uh, mm. That was our first salary, daily salary. But it's not something that you was like okay having it right away. Sometimes they collect it and sometimes they never pay it. Sometimes they pay some and don't pay some. And but you just have to keep rolling because you didn't have anything else. So yeah. But uh, yeah, at that time we weren't strong enough. Even though I was bigger than my age, at nine years old, I wasn't like big enough and strong enough to shovel like those big sand with a shovel, you know, or to dig a mountain of sand as you might see here uh, or in some of my video. But we were like trying to help to move sand from different places to places. And uh, down the road, we became stronger and useful and able to do everything, uh, to load uh, the truck, to shovel from the river, to dig in the mountain. And uh, I haven't become the best in all of you because I was very solid, very strong. I was capable of doing multiple people jobs one in wow. one day. <laughs> wow. So, okay. So even though you grew up in kind of like really, really difficult circumstances, you somehow, your, your passion was boxing and you somehow knew you would be a world champion one day. How did you know that? First of all, like uh, at that age, my passion was in boxing. I didn't know mm -hmm. exactly what I want to do in my life. Um, I remember my parents divorced. I was nine years, I was six years old. My I was six years old when my parents divorced. And uh, I went to my uh, mom, to my mom, mom's family and uh, mm -hmm. started to hear people talking about my dad and it wasn't great. I started like hear that. And, uh, and I think the first thing that I want, I didn't want to do that I knew, I knew in my life was not to become uh, like my dad anything close than my dad because I didn't want people to talk about me like they were talking about him but the uh, problem I love everything uh, power related so how to implement my passion in something that is not violent I mean it was quite difficult to manage that but uh being to school, be frustrated all the time uh, by the situation that we were in, uh, getting pulled out in the class all the time. Uh, I get to the point that uh, I, one day I was so frustrated about it uh, and I was so upset. Like, you know, I've been working in the sun quarry for, for a long time now. I never go to a holiday. I never did anything uh, fun. Um, the, the weekend, I was in the sun quarry. The holidays, I was in the sun quarry. Uh, the wet season, I was in the sun quarry. The wet, the, under the rain or under the sun, I was in the sun quarry doing the job that even adults in the wet season didn't want to do because it was, it was raining sometimes all day long and um, they didn't want to work. So that was the opportunity for us to work because there was not a worker in the sun quarry. Uh, at that moment, but also that uh, they weren't paying people at that time. So with all that combined, I find myself someday like get kicked out of the classroom again. And I think that was, and I was 13 years old by that time. And uh, that was the day that in my uh, madness, in my uh, upset, I realized one thing, uh, that could be because I wanted to prove, um, I felt like I, I need to prove something basically to those kids that view me as uh, someone that is beneath them, you know, uh, despite everything that I was doing, this, despite all the effort, I was still like, I can be put out from the classroom. And that's how that day, that exact day, I kind of like think about it, you know, when you get in that position, like doing a normal thing will not elevate you enough for people to see that you are not worthless, you know? So I wanted to do something that's gonna put me high up, that's gonna put me on this uh, stage and uh, combine everything, the reputation of my dad, 
combine my passion with combat sport, combine my frustration, combine my combine uh, with my um, uh, uh, need of like uh, proof uh, my worth, my worth. I um, I come across boxing, and that was the perfect thing uh, for me. Or before that, I was like. Oh, I love karate. I love kung fu because that's what we were watching on movies, and it was very <laughs> efficient. But I realized that boxing is the way to go, and the thing to do. But problem, there wasn't a gym around the village or the state, so I have to wait eight years, nine years, actually, after I left school, stay in the village for a couple of years. Then I decided to move when I was 22 years to move in a different place uh, in the city to start boxing, I was 22. Yeah, <clears throat> so tell me tell me what happened when you were 22 and you decided to leave your village and find a gym. You went on this journey that I, I don't think anybody can imagine. No, uh, that wasn't in tw at 22. Like, uh, so um, I left the village. I was driving a uh, motor, uh, doing the taxi with motorcycle, as you mm. might see sometimes. And then uh, I saw the bicycle, the motorcycle, and then I left the village and I went in the city, like I'm going to do boxing. And then people was like, they thought I lose my mind. I'm like, okay, so uh, this is your job. This is what you put food on the table. You sacrifice that in for the boxing like what the hell is boxing have you ever seen somebody that have succeeded in boxing in this country it's not meant for us and everything that they could say and i mean to be honest it's not like they were wrong that was just the reality out here but i was stubborn enough i have this dream inside me like so deep which still today i still ask myself why i kept believing in that dream i can't tell you but what I know for fact is that I believed in it so bad that nothing could have put it out of me. I didn't know that I'm gonna make it. I have no clue. I mean, the reality was there, nobody had made it, even those who have had more chances, but uh, and I wasn't like in the position of someone that has a chance, but I just love the thing. Let's just do it, doesn't matter. If I made it or not, at least let's enjoy the process. It's not about the destination. It's also about, mm -hmm. and even more about the process. So I'm like, just enjoying it. And uh, it wasn't easy. You know, I need to like make a living and then keep training. And in okay. the new city that I know nothing in that city, I have to figure it out. So it took me like, a year to figure out then i got sick get little problems then give up boxing i didn't give up i stopped training because i have to like cure myself um, mm -hmm. then um, when i came back i realized that it's not good nothing's good is going to happen if i stay here you know mm -hmm. uh, but i'm not giving up i haven't tried everything yet uh, and then I still have one shot, which is like leave the country and go somewhere. But where? I don't know. And also, <laughs> like, I couldn't afford. I was 20, uh, 26, almost 27, but still 26 at that time. And uh, I couldn't afford, like, go for a visa to apply for a visa in any consulate. So I took the route from uh, migration then move country after country from Cameroon to Nigeria, from Nigeria to Niger, Niger to Algeria, then Algeria, Morocco. Morocco was a, the, uh, how can I, the roof of the challenge, you know, like, yeah, if something has ever been challenging in my life, it was that step. Like, can you describe some of the things that happened to you while trying to go from Morocco to Spain? Oh, <laughs> first of all, like most of the time, we have to just stay in the forest, in the bush, 
sleep in the bush, like we sleep on the ground and um, hunt animals. You know, uh, we have no clothes, but in the summer it's okay, but in the winter, oof. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we have to stay there with the, with night, the night to fall, so we can go to the market, uh, in the trash in the market, and find whatever they throw away, whether it's a rot rotten potatoes or a chicken leg or a rotten tomato, and then we go back in the forest and cook in the in this like uh, alum like a uh, steel bucket that we find mm -hmm. somewhere, um, and uh, you know, and then keep organizing and trying to go to the fence. Um, Sometimes we fail. We just want to make sure that you don't get caught. <laughs> if you try in the fence and fail, just make sure that you don't get caught because what happened in the video that I share. Mm, uh, I saw that. Ago, yes, that will happen to you for sure. And when you're a big guy like this, they consider you as a leader and your punishment is, is multiplied. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, but I also try in the ocean uh, multiple times in the different location from uh, Tangier. I try and fail, get rejected to uh, to the desert, come back over and over. During one year, I was just trying. I fell in the ocean six times, but uh, I succeeded the seventh time. Like wow. Okay. So this, this is what I thought was really interesting about your story is that most people, <laughs> when they do that six times, I think at some point they'll be like, you know, all right, like, I don't think this will ever work. I'm just going to go back. But you saw it as a challenge in a way to iterate and change your tactics in order to succeed. Is that the way you saw it? Or is it just just the way that you are when you approach problems. As you were asking me earlier, like why did I keep doing it? And I couldn't tell you. Uh, first of all, I knew that something is abroad for me. Something is on the other side. I don't know what, but I know that something is there for me. I always knew that I have a bright future, mm. but it was even, hard for me to explain to people because that seemed a little pretentious they were like oh you're just another dreamer i could have felt it i knew that i have only i have that obstacle to go through and also like um, you know when you get to a point of your life that the only choice that you have is no choice you do whatever you have to do. You know, mm -hmm. there wasn't a, a chance for me to come back. There wasn't a chance for me to return. Like, I wasn't going to quit because like, returning was quitting. And the thing is that like, as soon as you leave your country, you became the hope of your family. Even though you haven't made it there, they don't know where you are, but they're just like, oh, is um, outside of the country. Well, he might made it, you know, mm -hmm. and coming back was like tearing their dream. Coming back was like uh, condemning my kids to go through whatever I've been through and you have to do whatever you have to do and whatever it takes, you're gonna give it to him. So be before, uh we hit record uh, when I told you about the green card lottery, you said something interesting, which was you applied to the lottery a few times, but you weren't going to leave your future in the hands of a lottery. You had to take it, take it in your own hands. Do you believe in luck? Yes, I know. It's a very tricky question. You know, uh, I tried like three times uh, the American, the green card, the American uh, lottery, the green card. Um, and it didn't work. I mean, and also personally, I I don't know if I was wrong, but I knew that after like three times, and I knew that uh, that was just trying, 
I didn't go to school. I didn't have a high school degree. I didn't have a college degree. So like, I knew that I didn't have a good profile. And even though there was a, there is a million of people doing it. So you have to be like very lucky. I don't know if it's lucky or not lucky because like, sometimes luck might not be luck. What do you think is luck might not be luck? Because if I have won the American lottery, I don't think my life will be, I will end it, be ending up where I am today. Because maybe it will change my path. Maybe I will just have it get there and with my green card and have a common job, you know, be a security guard or whatever, you know, and get settled as I make, as I made it. And for a guy coming from here, it's like, you made it that for fact, but that wasn't like my dream, you know? So not winning the American lottery get me go through this challenge, this obstacle, this part which is once again, the things, one of the things that forges, forges the person that I am today. You know, like, I remember like when I made it in Europe, when I went in France, I was sleeping in the, I was homeless sleeping in the parking lot uh, in Paris. And people was like, feeling like so, pity about me, like, oh, sorry, it's not cool. It's this, it's that, oh, it must be hard. I'm like, don't you worry about me, you know, because I've been through so much that, I mean, in the last, like maybe the last 14 months I have seen, I have been to hell. So being in Paris and being homeless for me, oh, I was, he was like five-star hotel. It was a palace. <laughs> My people didn't have any ideas. It was there, oh, he's so hard. Oh, he's sorry. No, oh, he's this, he's that. I'm like, please, don't you worry about me. I'm doing fantastic. And mm -hmm. then I'm like, oh, you might, you might just as well as others uh, over expect from uh, uh, the, the West country because usually people coming from the West country, uh, from Africa, they think um, the West country is a uh, paradise, is a heaven. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't believe there's somewhere on earth that you're going to go and just find it heaven you know but i do believe that some places can give you an opportunity to build your piece of heaven and that's what i'm about to do i'm just excited and happy about the opportunity that i always wanted he has always been about the opportunity i never like think blame somebody from not giving me something i never because i don't think i deserve something I haven't done anything to deserve something, right? Like, I can't just sit here, there, and complain about this, about that, as I deserve it. I don't deserve anything, but I can earn something. And mm. my earning, nobody is going to take that from me. You know, my yeah. uh, my strength, my ability uh, that I, I learned down the road, my ability to stand up every time that I fall, is something that I have for myself. Nobody can take that from me. From me, you know, yeah. I earned it. I, by experience, I learned it. In the hard way, I learned it. You know, so once again, I don't know if like as much as, as I'm not happy or excited about my life or my past, but uh, I kept uh, since like 2014, I've been thinking about it, but I can't believe that all whatever happened in my life was the preparation for this moment. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't be what I am today without that past. You know, like, mm -hmm. and I think that's. Uh, on desire, but that's like one of the greatest thing that I have. Uh, when I find the day that I realize that I'm rich, mm -hmm. not rich because I have a money in the bank or because I have a car or a house, rich because I'm not scared of failing because I know that if I fail, I can start over and over and over and over. 
I have that skill, that skill that I learned down the road and that whatever, you can take anything, everything from me, but you cannot take that. It's just, it's just like integrated in me. Wow. Okay. So every time that you tried to get to Spain and you were pulled out of the water, did first, can you explain to people listening to this, like what happened when that happens? And then did you, on your next attempt, did you feel more confident because of the previous attempts and what you had learned? Uh, anytime that you fail a attempt, like first of all, we were using a uh, flatable boat, which is a little boat that you use in your swimming pool. You can use mm -hmm. in your swimming pool. Um, so, and then we were paddling. So we have no uh, engine. They, and they have all this uh, security, the radar, uh, mm -hmm. the radar and all these things. Sometimes you will be like, you no know, uh, caught in the radar and they come pick you guys bring you in this uh, police station and keep keep you there for a few days, then bring you down in the south and throw you like by the desert. And uh, that's what happened all, wow. almost all those time, you know. Wow. But uh, after every time that you get caught, is a lot of stress, a lot of frustration that you need some time to recover for that. And when you recover for that, and when you recover for that, you know, you have a little bit of confidence because you gain a little exper more experience, mm -hmm. but you are scared because you know what happened. It's just about like, well, cross my, your finger from not. They get, they have all this high tech, all this infrastructure, and you're mm -hmm. going there just leaning on your hope. And you have no more chance. No, you have no chance. I mean, at some point we were able, we we learned that like putting like aluminum paper around the raft was protecting the red redder to like mm. detect it. Stuff like that we learned out there. Yeah. And uh, I was a captain, even though I didn't know how to swim. <laughs> Wow. Just by, by experience, by being there so many times, I know how it works. You know, I was able to go to check the weather, uh, know if the weather is going to be good or not, uh, mm -hmm. the speed of the wind, uh, the route, if it's like south, south, north, um, the direction, mm -hmm. and all those stuff. So I knew all those stuff, all those. Uh, settings so okay so you eventually make it to Spain and then to Paris tell me where you were and how you heard about MMA for the first time first I met him in Spain yeah and then we get uh, they give us to the police there we was in the chair for like two months almost <laughs> but uh, then when in Paris I wasn't going to Paris actually I think uh, first, I wanted to go to, to England, but, okay. uh, you know, the problem is that even when you're in Europe, inside Europe, you can sneak and go to different places, but not in England. There is an, another control. And I was kind of like tired of it, you know, like, then I decided to go to uh, Germany because mm -hmm. the heavyweight boxing at that time was in the top with the Klitschko brothers. Mm -hmm. But for somehow people was just that I met was just like, yeah, we're going to Paris, we're going to Paris. Then I'm like, let's go see. I went in Paris and uh, the next day I found a, I was just like looking for a gym. Then I mm. found the gym. Like I kept, kept asking, they were showing me gyms. And sometimes some people just see me, uh, they saw me big and they assumed that I needed bodybuilding gym and they will send me those. then I will I go there like it's not a place keep finding until I went to this gym in the um in a in a 
11th, uh, ele <laughs> Paris 11th, and a gym named Kajin. Kajin. That was, yes. And then, you know, I tell them exactly like what was my, uh, the situation, what I was looking for. And uh, like, I just want to talk to a coach because I didn't have any money to pay for a, uh, to pay for a um, uh, membership. Mm -hmm. And uh, the coach wasn't there, but there was a guy there named DJ Camo. Yeah, then I found uh, I found this guy. Uh, the, mm -hmm. He was like uh, ho uh, holding the class that day, and I asked him about like, uh, and I tell him like, I just come here, I just came here, and I don't have any money to pay for a membership. I can I can afford it, but I, you know, I just want a place to train because I'm about I want to become a world champion. Mm -hmm. And he was very nice. And then he said he's going to speak for the coach on my behalf. And that was in Mo on Monday, July 10th. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next class was on Wednesday. And then he asked me if I have a phone number. Then I said, yes, he took my phone number. And um, on, um, on Thursday, he gave me a call and told me that the coach accepted that I can come <laughs> and train for free. Uh, but that was boxing, and yeah, then he started to give me stuff. I mean, the DJ come on, he started to give me stuff like gloves. And I'm like, yes, come, I have a pair of glove, gloves for you, and uh, he will start to give me like clothes and this, even a perfume, you know. Mm -hmm. It was always like being around for me, and uh, he was he was after like two weeks of training that's when he started to tell me like you're very skilled skilled you're very talented i think uh boxing uh mma uh, will give you the uh, faster income because that's what you need right now and that's the first time i have heard of mma then i'm like what is mma he said mixed martial art i'm like okay cool but what's that yeah. And what year? I, what year was this, Francis? 2013. Wow, that's the first time you heard of MMA. Yes, yeah. that was that was in June 2013. Yeah. Because I get in France in France June 9th. Then I found this gym on June 10th, 2013. So after like a couple of days, maybe a week or two, he started to talk to me about MMA. Then wow. he started to explain to me like this wrestling, this, this. I'm like, bro, leave me alone. <laughs> because because you had a love for boxing and MMA. I have a love for didn't... boxing. Yeah, I'm right. like, I want a, I want a, a boxing like Mike Tyson. And he was there explaining all this to me like, oh, you know, if you just have to learn some wrestling defense, some wrestling, take down defense, and you're going to be so great because you have a wonderful uh wonderful boxing and this i'm um, like please cut it out let's just oh, take on it yeah. on boxing but you know he was very like uh, pers uh persistent but mm -hmm. smooth you know he mm -hmm. wasn't pushing too much but he never let him go until like wow. once he find out that uh, after the gym was closed for one month for the august and then he find out that I, I'm in the gym that is doing MMA. Then, like, I tell him that, okay, I'm in this gym, they're doing MMA, I'm, be, I'm doing MMA there too. And then so I'm like, yes, that's cool. Then he came there, uh, pay for a membership just to, like, keep me motivated. You know, like, sometimes he would tell me, like, oh, he would call me in the morning, like, training day, like, oh, you will be in the training? Oh, then I'll be like, yes, I'm like, yeah, I'll be there because he was a big guy too. So sometimes it was good for me to have him around. Also, like he was a big guy. He was already like a friend, my first friend. And um, yeah, wow. so when he was about to be somewhere, I would be excited. But he would not come in the evening. He just wanted to push, you know, to keep push me. Um, yeah, 
until like one day we went there and the gym was closed and here i'm like let's go train in the park and it was about 5 p.m already i'm like mm, i'm not sure about that because by that time all the public shower was closed oh i couldn't take a shower anymore and then here i'm like i know that was the problem i get you i'm gonna then we went to the park train he has all the this part we was we were holding and kick box and then after training he took brought me to into his house into a apartment and you know i'm like oh he can stay here for a couple of weeks before we i put it in rent and then he hosted me there for two months wow yeah so y- you i mean everything is crazy to me, but uh, you eventually became the heavyweight champion of the world in this sport that you didn't know existed until, you know, a few years back. Can you just tell me about the first time you set foot in the United States and what you thought to yourself? Well, uh, I knew already, like, uh, I was already in the UFC. And then, like, you know, when I get there, uh, he was a red carpet, you know, from a guy that get in Europe, how I get in Europe, like my first time in the United States. You know, I was in the, um, I get in the airport uh, and there was this guy, this driver with a, a tablet with my name on it, like UFC, <laughs> Francis Ngannou. And I'm like, yes, it's me. And I wasn't speaking English, you know, just a few words. And then uh, brought me in the, this car took my suitcases, brought me in the car, dro- dro- drove me in the four, I think it was four star hotel. And they checked me in. I mean, people was taking picture with me, you know, that was a red carpet compared to like how I get in Europe, right? So uh, yeah, oh, I was like, oh, is that America? Like. I didn't, I get in America in the big, in the big way, you know, Yeah. Uh, and I call my, I call my family, I call my mom, like, hey, I made it, that American that we've been talking about, I am in America, for real. Wow, that's incredible. (laughs) And that was, that was in December 2015. Yeah, I was in America. That's incredible. I um, there's this mentality that I've noticed within my own family, uh, where we moved to the U.S. You know, no money, no, we didn't know anybody, nothing. Um, you, I mean, had ridiculous circumstances, but I saw that throughout your journey, you kept asking yourself, "What do I have to lose?" And I think that that's a question a lot of immigrants ask themselves, do you think that that mentality goes away as you get more comfortable or do you still think like that? I think it's also a mindset. I will not say a mentality is a mindset. Mm. Um, back in 2018, when I lose, when I lost again, uh, Stipe Miotic, the first time that I fought for a title, I started to have those anxiety mm. like of losing. And that's where I really lost something because I lost a fight without not without even fight. I was mm. having anxiety of, about like, oh, if I lose this, if I lose this, then I came. He was about, I realized that I kind of like lost down the road. I lost the reason of like what I was doing. I was so concerned about what people think I was so concerned about a lot of unnecessary things then I'm like you know what screw this first of all I didn't want to do MMA why I'm here because it was fun the only reason why I stay in MMA was because oh he was a combat you know as a uh, what I've been watching on movie he was a type of combat that you can throw some cake do some stuff like spinning kick high kick whatever you want to try whatever please you to try you can't do it there and he was just about fun until i find myself in the ufc then he became so serious that i was scared of losing something that's when i started to lose then i came back to like okay i tell myself like okay uh if this is the end let's have a beautiful ending a fun ending you know 
Then I get back there, kids start started knocking people out in the in the second, you know, just having fun. As I said, mm -hmm. it was just about the process. Mm -hmm. Since then, it's been going well. But that mentality, I would not say it's a mentality of immigrant, like uh, because like uh, most of the time, people that uh, never get stuff, people that uh, uh, are poor when they start to get things. Uh, mm -hmm they get stress of like losing it and they hold on into it. And that can also hold them back. You know, um, I don't hold on into things. I hold mm -hmm. because I know that like what I have the most, nobody can, I cannot lose it. Nobody can take it from me. It's my ability to start over. It's my ability to build, to start, you know, to overcome obstacles. And I think that's the reason why I'm here. And if I have to go into, into those again, I think I will overcome that even easier than before because I have been there and I know how hard it is. And I, you know, it's kind of, he will just be on a deja vu, you know? Yeah. Yeah, he will be a deja vu because I know that I will make it. And, and now I have more, even more confidence because like, you know, before I was like concerned that, oh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I will, might not make it. Maybe people are right of saying I will not make it. You know, uh, maybe I'm, I'm not thinking right, you know. But now with everything aligned, I'm like, well, I wasn't wrong at that moment. I wasn't wrong in this moment. You know, everything proved me right. So I know that I can, I'm, I'm thinking right. Yeah. And, and you, you said something that stuck with me earlier. You said that when you were growing up, your father kind of served as an example of what not to do. And I wanted to ask you, why do you think it's important to first understand who you are not before you understand who you are? I don't know. I mean, I didn't experience that. I would just speak for my own, for what I had. But uh, as I know, Maybe I'm not sure that if I had a decent parent that was home every time a normal family, mm -hmm. I would understand this. You know, mm -hmm. because like sometimes when you have a kid, you are educating them, they tend to like trying to do what they tell them not to do to see what happens, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And then uh, learning something is different, but understand the thing is on another level. Like mm -hmm. from that moment in my life that I understood that everything changes. The rest in my life, you, you cannot imagine how many trouble that saved me from. Like mm. just like, I didn't want to like be part of any trouble because I feel I was, I believe, I believe that I can have a, uh, I can accomplish something and uh, also I didn't want anything that would damage my reputation like I didn't yeah. want anything to do with that like don't even bring it up you know so and I, and I always say this like regardless what people can say about my dad uh, or what he was listen if there's one person on earth that impact my life the most that changed my life is my dad wow like the most the most education that i had in my life was from my dad mm -hmm. maybe by not by showing me what to do but by, by showing me what not to do by setting himself up as an example of what not to do like I mean, when you're six years old, you don't even know what you want to do in your life. You don't know anything. Mm -hmm. To be able to understand something at that age, I think is a blessing. Yeah. The only reason that I understand that was because of my dad. And going off of that, you did something very interesting at an early age that I found fascinating. You began kind of embodying a version of your ideal self at a really young age. So you were like, if I want to be a professional boxer, I have to behave like a professional boxer. So I'm not going to smoke or drink. I'm going to work out. 
how did you develop that sort of discipline when it was at odds what with what everybody around you was doing? It wasn't at odds for me. Like, mm. and that's one one thing that I think I'm also uh blessed with it. I always know what I want and what I don't want. Mm -hmm. Period. There is no there is never like a uh, doubt zone, like, oh, maybe I should do this. I always know what I want and what I don't want to want. Uh, I don't want. Like, I have problem with people and uh, some people that we hang around, we have problem and like get apart just because when they when we uh, go to the bar or something and I will be maybe drink a juice or something and they want to make fun or force me to drink. And then like, I'll, I'll, I get frustrated from somebody like trying to force me to drink. Like, what is the purpose of it? Like, what, what did it bring out of you? It, mm -hmm. it, for some reason, everything that people will force you to try is not what is good. I never see somebody like, oh, you should eat, you should eat. No, they don't like, mm -hmm. oh, you should drink. You should try this drink. Oh, you should smooth. Oh, you should do this. Maybe because that makes them feel better about yourself. I mean, I'm not judging you, but don't push me. If I want, I will do. Mm -hmm. But if I don't want, let leave me alone, you know? So I always know what I want and what I don't want. And when I set my goal, I do whatever. Or when I have a dream, I do whatever um, I have to do to achieve that. It might not happen, but mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that I give, I do and everything on my power, you know? Yes. Therefore, I have no regret and it's okay. It's just like any yes. way you can, you can have everything that you want, but you can try, give your best to have whatever you want. I love that. And, and one of my final questions is uh, when I think a lot of us, like when we reach a certain level of success, whatever that may be, we start to get complacent and, and kind of tie our identities and jobs or I, our identities around the jobs that we have and the titles that we have. But you haven't done that and you've consistently bet on yourself time and time again. How how do what how do you do that and how can we all learn to bet on ourselves more first of all about title i haven't had the title that i want what is the title that you want to be the best man i want to leave something bigger than just i mean if you mean title I mean like a, a heavyweight world champion well, guess what? I'm not the first. There is a lot out there. There was a lot before me, and there will still be a ton after me. Mm -hmm. Which is not bad. I'm not minimizing that, but I'm just saying I can trim down the, the competition. I can mm -hmm. do something better again, something that less people uh, have done it. You know, uh, I have different goals. I have different uh set up uh once again inspired by my dad from who he was i always want to be another version of him you know like uh who i want to be in in my family who i want to be for my kids who i want to be in the eyes of my family you know all these things you know uh regardless what happened in my life i'm fortunate enough to be here mm -hmm. I mean, I can't complain about anything. And either, in the other hand, the reason why, uh, I mean, I think I just have the ADN, the DNA of betting of myself. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at the story of my life, that's just my life, betting on myself. Mm -hmm. You know? And uh, if somebody know that uh, quote who says like, to jump, sometimes to jump farther, you have to step back. I know that, you know, you have to like take a decision. You have to so, start over so, some, you have to start over sometime, which is something that is very hard for people, even very talented people. They don't have that audacity. They don't have that courage to start over. And I think that's, makes a lot of difference between people, people that are afraid of starting over. They are afraid of start 
of losing something that they have already. They are holding on to that. They're like, I don't want to lose this. And they take it. They, they, they can take what they shouldn't be taking because they want to hold on to that. In my case, it's, it's, it's not the same thing. Like, I don't just care. I know that I'm going to be okay regardless. Mm. There's mm. nothing that I cannot handle. So therefore, I have to be, I have, I'm very picky uh, of what I want and I it's about what I want or not. It's not like a mirror, you know? Mm -hmm. Not sure that I'm going to have it, but I'm going to do anything in my power. For that so, purpose. so I want to ask you, because this, when I was working on your story, before I met you, I was left with this question. And now I'm left with this question again. Will you ever start over and bet on yourself again and pursue your original passion, which was professional boxing? For me, that is not a start over. Mm. That is just a continuous, a continuous part, you know? Mm -hmm. Listen, look at it this way. I'm, I set myself in the position that when, they are when I'm talking about boxing, I can right away talk about the champions. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense. It's legit. It's not a start over. It's mm -hmm. not like I'm going there to start with like no names, all this no name, and build and hope to get promoted and have my own name as everybody. It's not a start over. So what do you consider I, a start over? Maybe start another job. Maybe after retirement, go back to school, have a degree to manage some business or to do something which, which I'm passionate about. By the way, I'm thinking about it because I think by the 40s, I'll be by the by 40, I'll be retired. Mm. And I will take time to like start a new passion. And if I need to start a couple of years again for that, I will give myself that time and will start a new career in a different activity. For that's me, that's a start over, but I'm not afraid of. I'm excited about it because I know that I can make it. That's amazing. And my final question for you, Francis, is what does the word success mean to you? How do you define it? Success is a balance of like, I think success is a balance of, um, uh, I mean, personal um, well-being, personal happiness, accomplishment, uh, and uh, I mean, obviously, when they say success, there is always like a material, financial part of it, but there is never like the amount of what could be considered as a success. I think success is a, is a balance because like I saw once I saw one video of Tupac who was very interested, interesting. And uh, they was asking him like uh, how it is to be rich. And then he'm like, what is like being rich? What do you mean by rich? They were like, to have a lot of money. And he said, how much is a lot of money? And nobody could right. have answered that question. How much do you need to be rich? You, Paulina. Oh, me? How much me. money you would consider that you're rich? I don't need a lot. <laughs> how much is a lot? Well, right, exactly, exactly. Okay, that's the pro. That's the it's patient. all relative, yeah. It's all relative. But we can balance the money with happiness because personally like i see i came here sometime i see people that i mean people that i would say i even employ them they work for me but mm -hmm. i think then i find out that they have something that i don't have they have that balance mm. you know they have something it's not it's definitely not money because the money that he has is the one that i'm giving him Mm -hmm. but he has balance in his life he's happy mm -hmm. and i think mm -hmm. that's success personally i have seen 
I have seen a billionaire, which for me, I, I will consider him as a poor person. Mm -hmm. And I have seen what you will say, a poor person that I consider is a rich person because he has something that you cannot buy. Mm -hmm. Everybody can have money. Money comes and go, but happiness is not for everybody. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Francis. That was an amazing conversation. Thank you, Paulina.